your job. Great work. <laughs> um, so first of all, who I am. I'm Gerard. Uh, I work for Red Hat. Um, I'm living in China for many years. Um, that's why I speak a little bit of Chinese. Um, and I'm a principal software engineer for, developer, uh, for, for the uh, unit called Developer Tools. So before Red Hat, I worked on large-scale OpenStack deployments. Um, I developed a lot of codes that deal with agile projects. And that probably also explains a little bit why I kind of care about what I'm doing here. So currently, I'm working on container technology. Everything targeting Docker, Kubernetes, Podman, OpenShift, and it's specifically developer tools. The tools that I develop are all kind of utilizing virtualization to simplify a problem that we're having. Um, these can be libvirt KVM, Hyper-V, HyperKit, and something else that we are doing, machine drivers. So um, part of my work is that I worked on Minikube. Probably people have used that before. Um, it's it, almost essential if you want to learn about what Kubernetes is. So the project that I worked on at that moment is called Minishift. And now working on code-ready containers. So developer tools. Developer tools is uh, within Red Hat uh, a division that is uh, kind of focusing on tooling that has to deal with developing container-based applications. Container-based applications is a completely different way of how you should look at your application. And for a lot of people, that was kind of like how to start. So within Red Hat, they saw that there were a lot of tools in the market, uh, Mesosphere and, and Kubernetes not even a thing yet. And they thought, of, well, maybe we need something. And they called it ADB, the Atomic Developer Bundle. They provided different uh, tools to get, it, get you going on developing container-based applications. And over time, that developed just like uh, Kubernetes became a thing, more like, well, we should have something that targets specifically how to develop applications targeting that. And that became Minishift. So Minishift started out as a prototype tool from, uh, I'm not mistaken, Jimmy Dyson. Uh, worked a lot on Kubernetes, but for Red Hat specifically on OpenShift. And he took the source code from Minikube, forked it, and changed some stuff, making it work for our purposes which was good. It deployed a local OpenShift 3.0 cluster. It did it all in one, and it uses a method called OC cluster up. Everybody was happy because it worked. So that tool, being a prototype, was not perfect. So we took up the work and kind of worked on it, trying to make it stable and trying to get uh, the stuff in there that we wanted to see. Yeah? Because people use this tool eventually as kind of a means to learn about Kubernetes, learn about what OpenShift is, and especially and very important, develop and deploy applications in a very reliable way in a cluster that they have at that moment. Yeah? And especially here, because it is not easy to get Kubernetes up. It's especially not easy to get OpenShift up and running. Uh, and if people tell you, oh, you should run you know, on AWS, that's not an answer you want to hear. That's certainly not something you could do as most developers, huh? let alone that you have access to AWS or whatever. So that's why we've, we, we worked on this, and we noticed a lot. So one of the things, most of the things we learned was this, the lessons learned. And I'm pretty sure there's a guy there sitting who's from Minikube, our colleagues in a way. <laughs> so, what we notice is networking always complicated uh, deployment. If you understand how Minikube works, how you understand how Docker for Windows or for Mac works, it's a virtual machine. And a virtual machine is not your native machine. There's networking involved, the virtual networking layer. So as soon as a company would deploy this kind of tool, we ran into issues like, Oh, but I need to use a VPN to access my company resources. Well, that should not be an issue, right? But my VPN tool uses a route all. So every traffic, all of it, will go through the VPN. Oh, that's painful, because that means that the ac for your access to that VM will also all of a sudden go over the VPN, which is in that moment not local anymore. So we ran into a lot of issues here. 
Also, the other stuff that we notice is there were firewalls involved eh, and proxies, uh, especially on if you're doing Windows de uh, uh, deployment. Tools like your virus scanner, eh, McAfee, semantic endpoint protection, whatever tool there could be, they might inspect your packages and might, in that case, hey, this is a network segment that we don't uh, know, they would block the, uh, the access. Eh? Or proxies even. And especially here, proxies would be company proxies. Eh? Our uh, resources need to be accessed on a different place or via a proxy to actually get access to it. So how do you get that in a VM properly to work? Local machine, it works, but why doesn't it work in Minikube or Minishift? And especially when images were pulled from the internet. We all know that most of the Kubernetes images, and also for OpenShift, they live on, for instance, a registry. These registries are maybe uh, operated by Google, uh, Google Cloud Storage or Google Cloud uh, uh, Registry. Especially if you're here in China, most of my deployments would fail. And if I would explain to my colleagues why it failed, they would look at me and shrug, but it works for us. Yeah, but I think some of these images are actually hosted on a location that is not possible for me to pull from, right? So how to deal with proxies in that case or even Registry mirrors. Yeah? So um, this is a lot of stuff that we notice is mostly on networking, things fail. We worked a lot with actually the, the Minikube team also trying to s resolve a lot of these issues. But some of them are really complicated. They were not easy to deal with. Um, besides that, we were also working on LibMachine. If, if you know what LibMachine is, any of you maybe? OK, good. One or two fingers go up. So it's a library that uh, the uh, people at Docker made specifically for setting up Docker runtimes on platforms where they could self-contain it. So even on Linux, for instance, you would con uh, run up or spin up a very simple VM. And within that VM, there would be a Docker container runtime environment. Well, that's great, because that means that can, you can uh, kind of replicate on other platforms you're using a VM on Windows and a VN on macOS, and they would all be similar in a way. However, this uh, Docker library is dependent on the resources at that moment that Docker would put into it and the community effort. Uh, Docker decided at some point in time, well, this is not a library we will be using anymore, but we and Minikube were relying on it. So what to do then? We can try to support it ourselves, and that's kind of what we did is we forked off uh, several of these drivers and we created mi uh, machine drivers. But now it's still, it's on our, our maintenance with, with Minikube trying to get that stability. And it's hard because we are a small team, but, but we're like looking into it, what we can do there. But also the other problem that we're still having is we are forked from Minikube. So we're not Minikube. And we had talked many times with several of these team members what we can do there. We might be able to integrate a way to post start and, uh, and, and uh, uh, pre start to be able to actually get something in there that we can run our commands for de uh, deploying our tools. And a lot of these uh, ideas did formalize, but they were not in the time schedule that we were trying to develop it. Uh, one of them that, of course, was integrated was Cube Admin now. Uh, but for our case, we would like to have had that earlier, but yeah, unfortunately. So what we did instead is we fixed a lot of these issues, uh, SSH issues, we're trying to get access to the machine, stability issues with networking, uh, especially even in LibMachine, we had many issues resolving uh, around the idea of localization uh, and internationalization. But um, we, we noticed that Unfortunately for us, it's very hard to deal with uh, a fork project. It would have been better if we would have done that differently from the beginning. But we, when we started on the tool, it was a prototype. It was not our project. So, but even the worst part of it was, it was using a non-standard installation method. So it was not like OpenShift in production. And this is a very, uh, very bad thing, because if you're expecting to be able to run your application on this environment, but on your local desktop, it worked. You push it to the cluster, and then all of a sudden it would fail, which usually is the other way around. It, doesn't, it works on my machine, but 
So this was an issue. We, how, how are we going to solve that? And unfortunately, this was also not a thing that they were able to solve for us because, hey, you want a single node cluster, right? So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what then OpenShift 4, Code Ready Containers, and Cluster API is. So OpenShift 4 is a new version. Yay. But uh, just like the previous version of OpenShift, it provides everything you want to get your source to running an application, what we call source to image. But it provides with that a lot more. It becomes a trusted enterprise Kubernetes solution, highly available, which actually is for us a thing that we don't need. Uh, an installer provisioned infrastructure, auto updates, operators, and it would be deployed on Red Hat CoreOS. But yeah, we want to provide a developer tool that you could run on your local machine. And they even came with, well, there's a new installer. This new installer is also a product from the lessons they learned related to the installers they had. They had Ansible scripts and stuff, uh -huh, and they had a different installation methods, and it didn't work for us. So we, we looked, they looked at that and they came up, well, we'll have a new installer. And the new installer will kind of work as what we will do with, for instance, the cluster API. It targets, example, uh, for example, uh, the cloud providers. Uh, when the first release came out, they targeted AWS specifically. Uh, uh, but now over time, it will support Azure. It will also support to, to bring your own hardware and stuff. But Usually what it will do is it will try to maintain the nodes in the cluster. And this is what we call the installer provided infrastructure, IPI. With that, it will create nodes that run CoreOS, Red Hat CoreOS. To do that, it actually creates minimal uh, bootstrap and master nodes to form that control plane. This is all kind of like as what the, 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 um, a, a cluster API would expect. So, and after that, worker nodes are created using that cluster API. So how will that look like? So this is, for instance, your cloud provider. See it as your AWS or something else. It will int create an initial bootstrap VM. This bootstrap VM actually uh, encompasses kind of like a NetCD. It's an initial start for your cluster. It's an ephemeral VM. It means that this VM will not stay around. After the cluster has been created, this VM is not needed anymore. So it will start it up, and it will start the installation according to the things you've provided, the setting files. It uses Ignition for that. And at that same moment, with Terraform, it has created several masters to create your high available environment. And then it will wait around for the master nodes until the bootstrap VM is completely ready and serves up the configuration file that is needed to deploy the master nodes. So you will never have a master node that is specific to be started first and, and has all the resources to create the other ones. No, all the masters will be provisioned and started and created at the same time with the information from the bootstrap VM. So after that is done, you get rid of the bootstrap VM. After that, cluster API comes into play. So the cluster API is a way to deal with the creation of nodes within a, a very general way. For instance, if you want to create nodes on a platform like Amazon, you don't want to know and, and specifically want to know the Amazon API to talk from your cluster how to create these nodes. So for day one, there's an insula of, uh, installation of the cluster. And for two uh, day two operations, it deals with management, how to scale out, how to maintain them. So this is what it will look like then. After the masters are created, the cluster is ready in a way. But you can't run a workload. The masters, the control plane, is marked as tainted. I will not run your workload. So at that moment, it will just instruct I want worker nodes now. And these work like, kind of like any kind of resource, kind of like a replica set or a deployment set. I'm telling it, I want several of these. And therefore, the workers will be created. And it follows the same procedure in a way. It will create uh, with Ignition a request to, hey, I want now something that looks like a worker Ignition file. 
It talks to the uh, control plane, it retrieves that definition, and those nodes will be created. So, great. But this is mostly targeting cloud providers. So for us, that wouldn't work. So how do you develop this on a developer environment that's local? How are you going to test, actually, that something for the cluster API works as expected? So one of the things that we did in our teams is we worked on the libvirt cluster API. Specifically, a provider yeah, for the cluster API that deals with local libvirt environments. So um, in this repository, you can find more information about that, for sure. Uh, uh, I will later actually uh, show a video about that, a short demo. Uh, it's still, for now, in our uh, situation, it creates the bootstrap using Terraform. Yeah? But uh, so it will look like this. So there will be an operating system with a virtual machine monitor, in this case, uh, libvirt. There's a bootstrap that just gets created and the same masters. Exactly the same situation. So for the libvirt provider, there will be no difference in how we deploy. And then again, we instruct the cluster API to create the worker nodes. But then, that's not what we want. If you want to have a development tool locally, we don't want to create a high available environment. So we want a tool that provides a local OpenShift for cluster. We can have a new start, luckily. We have a new tool, new opportunities to do that, but hey, it needs to be familiar. Okay, it needs to be simple to use. It needs to do start, stop, delete, and set up. And emphasize here on setup. So we want it to stay as much as possible close to what Minikube did. This is what we have done before. That's the same as we did with Minishift. So we want to do that again, because this is what people expect. Although we do introduce a new command, like setup. We want to be able to take away the burden of getting it up and running easily. So, but then, it needs to be configured as a single node cluster, so no high availability. It needs to be targeting Linux, Windows, and macOS, and it needs to be optimized for use with hypervisors. So this is actually kind of where the, 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 the problem for us started. It's more like, how do we do that then? So let me see. So we created a, a single node cluster according to this repo, where we prefer to deploy master and worker on a develop uh, machine in a single VM instance, which means that we needed to disable certain things. Yeah? We untained the virtual machine. And now what we do at the end is, we create actually a VM image. Very simple, we bundle it up. This took away the problem for us that we had with actual packaging it up. Because when we did an installation before with Minishift, people would start it. It will pull images from the network. We would touch remote registries. These might not work because there was no network connectivity or it was burdened. So now you download a whole bundle of a VM and at that moment when you do start, it unpacks it, it starts the VM and everything is there. So the only problems that you will encounter is the cluster is up and then. So if the network is then unavailable, that's a different situation. At least you have your cluster, yeah? So, People said, but hey, but then I have a download with 1.9 G or more. Well, if you do a stop, start, delete, uh, start, delete, stop, whatever in order you do that, as soon as you deleted something before with Minishift or Minikube, this whole process of repulling happens again. And you're also pulling in that same amount of data. So wouldn't it be better than in that case to use a VM? And at least what we got is it's a reliable way. For, at least for our situation, this works perfectly. Um, if we want to do nightly releases, for instance, of OpenShift or even Kubernetes, it's slightly more difficult because we're not going to create these images, although we're now considering maybe actually to do that. Yeah? So, but then there's another thing. People still actually want to be able to uh, scale out uh, the, the machine set. They ask us, but now I have that single node VM, uh, the single node cluster. Is it possible to actually use the cluster API? Yes, it is. We are now at the moment still developing it. It's kind of a work in progress. There needs to be some changes for that because you miss some images on your local machine. But it's actually possible to actually also talk to the, the same uh, environment and say, well, scale out. I have a single node cluster, but now I want several workers. Is that possible? Yeah, sure. Change the replica set. 
and it will create for you new workers because it will be able to talk at that moment to your local liver, uh, uh, liver demon. So that will look like this. This, this is kind of at the moment the handwork you need to do a little. You need to enable liver to listen. You will need to be able to uh, talk to this endpoint. It has to be very specific because it's now hard coded in the, in the liver environment, but that's actually kind of what we always deploy. So this should work. We changed the, the, the replicas from zero to actually what you want. And uh, it should be able to spin up your worker nodes. Actually, it says here zero, but it should be. <laughs> so, so now the current state that we have with uh, code-ready containers, we are able to deploy on libvirt and KVM uh, as the original targets. We had a lot of good feedback about that. Um, we are still now working on the actual HyperKit uh, solution. We, we bumped into uh, some issues, but they were related to some driver issues. We have resolved them now, and they will be uh, proposed upstream. Uh, and we're kind of now looking at Hyper-V. I'm just beginning to do that. This, I'm working on Windows actually for this also at this point. But we're expecting to have this also maybe in a short time to be able to have Hyper-V support plus VirtualBox. Um, so I see that the time is uh, quite short. Um, future. Uh, as I said already, we want to be able to work on Hyper-V. But this needs specific support. Uh, if you know if you're having a cluster, you need to be able to use DNS. And specifically uh, for OpenShift, uh, it will actually have inter-cluster communication based on domain names. So we need to provide the DNS solution. We've been testing it now for VirtualBox, and it works perfectly. So we'll be able to, to uh, see if this will also work for Hyper-V. Uh, our next step after that is we are anticipating uh, really to release an upstream project for this. Uh, Minishift was always upstream first, but unfortunately for this situation now is how OpenShift got released. We have to kind of do the reverse. We're now looking at if uh, Fedora Chorus will have an image for that uh, or CentOS to provide our basis for that. But the other stuff that we're actually also looking into is done. Well, besides that, we could also integrate tools for Podman and Builder. Uh, we have been working before with uh, people who did the bot, uh, boot to Podman project for that. And we're trying to see if we can help out with harmonizing some of these images and, and tooling set for that. Uh, we're also looking at uh, the machine drivers again, uh, especially for Minikube, is, this will be very helpful. We've solved a lot of issues that are related to networking, like static IPing, uh, and we'd like to see how we can help with that to get that up and running for them. And more cooperation, hopefully, in the future with them. So um, the how about then? I've talked about um, possible um, multi-node clusters on libvirt. Yeah? And which is kind of similar in the sense of like getting it onto a, a cloud provider because there is a, a provider for that. But how about Hyper-V then? At the moment, there is no support or no cluster API targeting Hyper-V particularly. There's now uh, work ongoing for Azure and we hope to leverage a lot of the same things. But the way that communication is handled is slightly different. So we're looking at how it's possible to kind of have an intermediary uh, if we want to do that on your local machine that understands uh, the WinRM uh, protocol for management to actually start local machines on Hyper-V. Uh, this is very preliminary. We haven't made any decision. Uh, we kind of have the same problem for HyperKit. HyperKit itself has no management tooling whatsoever. So there are no tools actually to easily deal with lifecycle of that. So is there something that we might have to create for that if we really want to create a local uh, uh, cluster API provider for that? And these are questions that we have, and we would like seriously to hear from people if, what their thoughts about that is. So I will stop here. I would like to thank you. Uh, that's my WeChat, if you want to sync up and, and talk to me. Um, um, again, if you want to send me an email, uh, particularly uh, about Minishift or uh, code-ready containers, please send it to uh, Red Hat. But if you have questions about community in general, because I, uh, a lot of people know me from there, you can also use my personal address. Okay. So I want to open the floor for questions and answers. Okay. Always.
there's people in the first row. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, actually, I think I misunderstood the word uh, desktop virtualization because what I was trying to do is to put the uh, GUI applications inside a container and then manage it by uh, Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. So uh, actually, we are already uh, succeeded in uh, putting the Linux-based application inside the container. Right. And, uh, yeah. My question is, is it possible to run a Windows-based uh, GUI application inside a container and manage it by Kubernetes? Thank you. Well, that's not the purpose of our project, but I, I know that people have been looking at that, especially specifically for Windows containers and stuff. Um, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that for you. I could ask around what we can do about that, because one of the things that we even as Minikube also talked about many times, people want to be able to run a local cluster, maybe from their VM or whatever, that talks to multiple Windows servers in their environment or whatever, or virtual machines that run that. Uh, at the moment, we don't have a good solution for that. I have to be honest about that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I use CRC, and it, it already is a much much better experience compared to uh, running CRC. Uh, Great. I'll say before on uh, AWS. So yeah. my question is this: um, uh, So in Minishift, there is the profile command. Uh, right. 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 Um, okay, so uh, in Minishift and in Minikube, you can have multiple instances on your machine, uh, which is uh, if you're working on different projects or different streams, it could be very helpful. I understand that. Um, for Minishift, this was possible, and for Minikube, because the resources that you would use on a machine were kind of quite minimal. It wasn't that much. So at this moment, since we're quite early with uh, code-ready containers, we have decided to be now a single profile, a single instance. Um, but in future, it is possible for us to very easily provide the support to have multiple instances. We have everything in our code base already handling this. There are multiple uh, uh, ways to, to, to talk to the VM. We have names properly uh, uh, coded for that. Uh, we could even have multiple uh, virtual machines within an instance, like for instance, a, a master and a worker. So we already have support for a uh, multi-node cluster. So we have support for that in future, but at this point in time, it's not something we have focused on. We've now only got the first alpha release out for, I think, is it three, four weeks? So it's, it's very early on, um, but I would definitely see uh, people requesting it. So yes, it's, it's a, an option. It's, it's possible. Thank I just you. can't tell you when. <laughs> Well, I would like to thank everybody then. Uh, if there are more, more questions, may you enter, Okay, thank you.